and welcome. The Lord be with you. As we begin today, returning to the sanctuary for worship, and some of you at home, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we do worship here in the sanctuary on the traditional and unceded lands of the Algonquin people. Knowledge of God is a delight, but there is always more to discover than we can ever know. And so we come today seeking God's peace, seeking mercy. We come seeking to do good, to open our hearts to God and each other. We come trusting that as we draw close to God, God will show us the way. And so we begin, as we always do, with prayer. Let's pray. Generous God, wise and loving, gracious and merciful, you who are the breath of life itself. As the morning dawns and a new week begins, we praise you for the gift of light, light that awakens us at the start of each day and the greater light that comes to us in Jesus Christ. In him you became human. Walking in this world, you shone the light of your love into its dark and darkest corners. Time and again, you continue to do so. You come to us, no matter how late in the day it is, you gather us up. You call to us to be part of what you are doing and you sustain us in our living. As we come this morning, we pray that you would increase in us a generous spirit, that we might walk in your ways with joy and celebrate with others who you love. Eyes open to all who you would welcome into your kingdom. For we confess that while we welcome your grace in our own lives, we are not always quick to celebrate when others are welcomed. Worried about our own status or honor or greatness, there are times when we have looked at the blessing of others and in jealousy lost sight of the ways you bless us. Forgive us, God, and deliver us when we have judged the efforts and faults of others and ignored our own motivations in doing so. Forgive us and deliver us. Restore us, O God, to your ways. Help us to receive your gift of justice and mercy as good news for all, and restore to us the joy of your kingdom. Teach us to welcome one another as you welcome us. In the name of Jesus, Lord and Savior, who invites us to pray to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, Jesus Christ and God, and Jesus Christ extends to us mercy and grace beyond anything we could ever understand. So let us receive these gifts that we might live as grateful and forgiven people. Thanks be to God.
On behalf of the Kirk Session, good morning and welcome to those in the sanctuary and those watching at home. Wherever you are, we are so glad you are with us. The announcements are found in the bulletin and most programming remains online. Please take some time to read it through and see what opportunities interest you. I do have just a few items of note. We are planning for the worship service on October 4th to be in the sanctuary, but we will not celebrate communion at that time. Rather, there will be two opportunities to participate in a Zoom service, just as we did at, in June. One will be at 11 a.m. and one will be at noon. And registration will be through the office. The elder elections have concluded, and thank you to all who voted. We are in the process of contacting those who received strong support from the congregation. Wednesday Bible studies continue, and Men's Fellowship meets on the 28th. Thank you, and stay well, everyone. The scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 145, verse 1 to 8. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will, pr I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. The greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall lodge your words to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. This is the word of our Lord. Balloons! Yes, I know, they're so exciting, right? It's so sad we can't celebrate it with all the children, but they look amazing. And if you haven't gotten a balloon in the mail, you should have got one if you're a child. So let me know and I will make sure that you get it. That would be great. The reason we have balloons is because this is Rally Sunday in the church this year. Yes, and so we are doing Sunday school registration, and so uh, the registration is now up on the website, and we need you to please register your children every single year just so that we make sure that the um, information is updated. Right, and that, that is part of what we do on Rally Sunday, but it's also the day when we get to celebrate that you are going back to school, probably maybe in different ways this year, um, and that we're starting church school and all the church programs here as well. And as we do that, Rally Sunday is an opportunity to stop and celebrate and remember that God is always with us. Yeah, for sure. And some of you guys are doing school online, some people are doing it in person, some of you are going back to daycare or preschool. Um, whatever you guys are doing is important and special. And here at St. Andrews, the church school and the programs in the church are starting too. Last year at this time, we had a guest speaker who suggested we think of it like this. We are starting up again in the school of Jesus. We are beginning all our programs that help us to learn to be like him and to follow him. So that's not just the children, that's all of us. In this new school year, we take this time on Rally Sunday to remember that God loves us and God is with us always. Yeah, for sure. And he will be with you every single day at school. If you're having a good day or a bad day, God will be there and you can count on that. Right. And so if you were between three and 12, you got a balloon in the mail, but you also got a backpack tag. And I'm much older than 12, but I got a backpack tag too. And I'm very excited about that. <laughs> I'm going to put mine on my computer bag. And and the hope is it reminds you that wherever you go with that backpack or computer bag, you know, you know that God is with you. Mine says, peace be upon you when you're having a good day or a bad day. May God's peace be upon you. Yeah. So in your bulletin, all of you who are in service this morning should have an insert, and I will provide this to um, the families this coming week. 
but your insert should have um, a prayer that we're going to say together. So I'll start, and then Karen and everybody, if you're comfortable, can say, Jesus is with you, or it may say, Jesus is with me. So let's begin. When it's the night before going to school and I'm picking out my clothes and making sure I have all my school supplies. Jesus is with me. When I'm waking up and eating a healthy breakfast to start the day. Jesus is with me. When I'm getting on the bus or being driven to school. Jesus is with me. When I meet my teachers and new friends in my class. Jesus is with me. When I'm playing with my friends at recess. Jesus is with me. When I'm finding the right school bus to ride home. Jesus is with me. When I'm telling my family about my day at school. Jesus is with me. When I'm praying at night and thanking God for my family, my friends, and my school. Jesus is with me. So I don't think we have any children in the sanctuary, but if you are an adult, you can do this as well. So you guys can reach your arms up high. You can stretch them out wide. You can maybe try and touch your toes. I don't know if that'll happen. And let's give our hands a clap and let's put them in our lap and let's close our eyes as we talk to God. Thank you, Jesus, for always being by my side. I know that if I get nervous or afraid, you will be there with me. And when I see my backpack tag on my backpack, I will remember that you are always there. I know that I can talk to you with anything, day or night, and for that I am so thankful. Thank you, God, for our Sunday school teachers, for the Christian education leaders and programs, for those who lead us in worship, our choir and our choirs, even as they're not with us now, the inspiration they provide. We provide that you would give them guidance for the ministries they do, words to say when teaching us, we pray a blessing over the Sunday school teachers. We pray for Afua and Santa and Johanna and Stacy, for Lorna and Chide and Eleanor and Joshua, for Lynn and Tim. We thank you for Coco, who's the church school superintendent, and we ask that you would bless them and their families, that you would keep them safe and healthy. And God, we just pray that you would bless every child that uses this backpack and um, be with them as they learn and grow this year. Show them how to serve you and how to teach, uh, teach us all about your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's always exciting to have something new to put on my backpack or my computer bag. Today, as we open the scriptures, what we receive from Jesus is a parable. Parables are an invitation to enter into God's kingdom, to think about how we might discover it here among us. Sometimes they're meant to challenge us, sometimes inspire us. So as we open this teaching, let's pray. Gracious God, as your word comes to us this morning, perhaps surprising us, certainly challenging us, as you offer us this parable of your kingdom, may it work within us. May it transform the way we see things and bring us into alignment with you and your kingdom. Come and find us today, God, wherever we are, however we are, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to see the kingdom you are bringing about. Help us to hear your calling to us to be part of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, the first 16 verses. And we hear that the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And when he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and going to the first. 
And when those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, Those last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. He replied to them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Carmen. There is certainly a strangeness to the parable we were given today. The one I read to you just a few minutes ago about the workers in the vineyard and just how they were all paid. It begins, it, it's strange as it ends, but as it begins, it's actually quite ordinary in a setting that the original audience, those that Jesus were was first speaking to, even those that first read Matthew's gospel, they would have recognized this setting of the marketplace and the householder or landlord, or landlord going out to the marketplace early in the morning to find workers for his field. And this happens. He shows up early in the day, he finds some workers, he negotiates a daily wage for them, a, a really fair price for their work, the amount they probably need to keep their families well and fed, and and it looks normal enough. And Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is like this. It's rooted in the things of daily life. And yet it's also about to take a strange and surprising turn. Because the manager doesn't just go away with his laborers for the day. He comes back to the, the marketplace a few hours later. Like, who does that? It's 
nine o'clock and he sees some workers standing by and they're idle and he sends them to his vineyard and he says that he will pay them what is right for them to do that. And then he comes back at noon and then he comes back at three o'clock in the afternoon and he does the same thing. One wonders if managers usually do this, keep coming back to the marketplace, but, but this, this landlord does. And then he comes in again at five o'clock in the evening. The day is almost done. Work is probably just winding up for the day back in the fields, but, but there are some more idle workers there, people with nothing to do. And he says, why are you standing around? And, and they tell him, well, no one hired us. And now with no promise of anything, he sends them to their field, to the fields and, and off they go. And if all this isn't strange enough, the time comes for the landowner to arrange for his manager to pay the workers. And he starts with the ones who showed up at five o'clock, the ones who'd been promised absolutely nothing, and the manager gives them a day's wage. They've only been there a short time. A day's wage. Before we try to explain it, let's try sitting in this parable for a, for a little while. Let's imagine that you guys over here are the first group. You showed up early in the morning. The landowner recruited you to go and work in his fields. And you have been working all day really hard and the sun has been really, really, really hot. And then over here are the group of you who showed up in the marketplace around nine o'clock. Just try and think what that feels like. So you put in a pretty long day. And over here, for those of you who showed up at noon, you've been working all afternoon, three o'clock. And then over here are the few of you who, you showed up at the last minute and you have just received a full day's wage. What are the rest of you thinking? I mean, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? What are you thinking? How much is he gonna pay you? <laughs> and then this is what happens. <laughs> you and then you and then you and finally you you all get the same amount as these guys a day's wage even those of you who've been here all day you get the same amount as these guys like what do you think of these guys now and how are you looking at each other and what are you thinking of the landowner and his manager we have all, I suspect, at some point or another, been the one who has worked long and hard and seen others rewarded for doing very little. Flashback, group projects in university or high school when you share the grade with the whole group, regardless of who does the most work. It speaks to the perennial challenge of those who see themselves doing the lion's share of the work and how they look at those who they think aren't carrying their share of the weight those who have been around the longest and are sometimes surprised that the voice or vote of newcomers carries the same weight as theirs. Stories like this, they surface when we hear the parable. We've all been that person. What is going on here? Those of you who arrive first protest. It's insulting. Why would these guys who only worked for a very short period of time get what we get? Why aren't we getting more than them? like more recognition or money or something, whatever. Most of us can relate, can't we? I'm not asking of others what I haven't done myself, we might say, and, but, but really. And the protest of the workers in the vineyard goes like this. We worked all day and we only got paid as much as those who came late. You have made them equal to us. <laughs> we have borne the burden of the heat, the scorch of the day, and you have made them equal to us. That's the heart of their cry. These latecomers seem to matter just as much as we do. I mean, maybe in our mind we're thinking, do we really want them to be treated the same way? Don't we want to be treated as better than or them as less than? Where's the justice? What is justice in this situation? We can relate. The landowner turns to those who worked all day, and he calls them friends. And, and he does it in 
a way that is used elsewhere in the Bible where it really is a question whether they're friends or not. <laughs> friends, he says. I paid you what I said I'd pay you, a full day's wage. And yes, I chose to give those who came last the same amount, but am I not allowed to do what I want with the things that belong to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? Are you envious because I'm generous? That's what the landowner wants to know. The people who came first want, to, want an understanding about why they've been made equal with other people who haven't worked as hard. But the landowner says, are you envious because I'm generous? Envy. It's a longing to possess something that is achieved or awarded to someone else. Kind of related to jealousy. It involves the resentment when someone has gained something that you think you have deserved. Perhaps the coworker who got the promotion after only a few years on the job and you had to toil a decade to get it to, to a similar position. Or when you find out from the person sitting beside you on the plane that they bought their ticket at the last minute seat sale and paid a fraction of the price you paid. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to be happy for them because although we paid what was the right fare at the time, we now feel slighted. And when we are jealous or envious, it does not bring out our good side. When someone else's good fortune seems to be an affront to our own, it affects how we look at each other and how we look at ourselves. Certainly how we look at the landowner. When we're envious of what others are given, we sometimes lose sight of what we were given ourselves. We got a fair day's wage. <laughs> but envy can cause us to diminish our own gifts and talents and seek to rob others of theirs. The generosity of the landowner is an affront to the workers who came early, even as they have exactly what they worked for. Go your way then, says the landlord. And as we sit in the parable, well, we've all been at some point the person who came first, worked hard, who seemed to invest the most. <laughs> but we have all also been at some point the one who got late, came late the one for whom the deadline was extended for special circumstances, even when everyone else had to have their paper in on time. One of the interesting things about this parable is that Jesus didn't say anything about those who came early or late. There's nothing to say they belong to a different ethnicity or, or had a different identity from the workers who came early. There's nothing in there that actually said they were idle because they were lazy or infirm or they didn't get there on time. Maybe they were just caring for a loved one and arrived late. Maybe one of those emergencies that come up in life had happened. We don't know. But we've all been that person and we know the difference that grace can make in our lives when it reaches out and surprises us and we receive what we didn't expect. And it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> We're so glad when grace comes our way. So why are we so hesitant to share it with others? It's a parable of the kingdom, says Jesus. And there is something about the way we read this parable that certainly shows us something of the kingdom, while at the same time holding up a mirror to us and the ways of the world we live in as well. The parable has something to say about God's kingdom confronting the way we live. It shows us the motivation of the landowner who's entirely generous, and it asks us to look at our own as well. There's certainly something of God in the landowner and something of us in people who show up whatever the time. What kind of God pays everyone equally? It's not the only story in the Bible like this. Yes, it's not unlike the story of Jonah, who gets called as a prophet to go and preach to the Ninevites, who are the arch enemy of his people, telling them about their coming doom if they don't repent. And then they repent, and so they're saved, and he's so upset. Or the prodigal son 
who squandered his father's fortune and comes home and is welcomed lavishly and his older brother who has always been responsible and has never been honored for that is so upset. It's not fair. <laughs> There's something about the ways of the kingdom that aren't fair by the standards of this world. And yet, in it, everyone receives the welcome they need, the wage they need for the day, what their family needs to live. As part of a long line of stories and teachings in the biblical tradition that reveal to us that God's care is not just for one people, but for all people. Parables are open-ended. <laughs> This one has been interpreted in many ways. It has been ascribed to the tension between Protestant understandings of grace and, and other faith understandings of works as we see it. It's been used to talk about the way we understand people who came to faith and were Christian all their life and maybe those who only came to God at the end of their life. It, the truth is, I think it can speak into so many different situations. It's a parable of the kingdom, after all, and the kingdom is breaking in all over the place. Except for that the kingdom of God, I don't want you to think, is a place. It's not. The kingdom of God is the experience of God at work in the world wherever. <laughs> The kingdom of God is not some place you go. It's an experience of God at work here and now, breaking in in so many different places. When Jesus is speaking about the kingdom of God at this point in Matthew's gospel, he is on the road to Jerusalem. He, he is almost there. He will be crucified not, not long from now. And as he goes, he is gathering around himself a new people, a new community, a new order who will become his presence in the world when he has ascended back to his father. This parable is an invitation to think about the way God is at work in the world, not just so that we recognize God, but so that we can take it into the way we live in the world as ambassadors of God's kingdom and signs of God's presence ourselves, so that in us, no matter what time we showed up, <laughs> so that in us, God continues to show up at the marketplace all day long, wherever and whenever it might be, so that others might be called into the work of God's kingdom. We're all welcome. Jesus speaks to the disciples as they struggle to understand what this reign of God means. <laughs> Within old frameworks like rich and poor and superior and inferior, he is trying to create the possibility of something new. And a parable is open-ended. It, it shows us something of the kingdom and it holds up a mirror to how we're living and, it, and, and puts them in confrontation so that we might begin to be part of that new community Jesus is forming to be God's presence in the world. Can we put aside things like ego and our own need for appreciation and pick up a generosity that violates the ordinary senses of what's just and proper and who gets what? Can we celebrate another's good fortune and even contribute to it? Can we be like God and instead of being bookkeepers, holding grudges and adding up where we stand in the ledgers of life, can we get go of the things that keep us from joy and adopt a generosity of spirit? I think the calling here is that through the church and the community of those who who follow Jesus, the kingdom will continue to show up in the marketplaces all around the world, wherever, whenever, at all times of day. And one last thought. If we in our living testify to the generosity of the landlord and live generous lives, will not more people come to work in the vineyards with us? What do you think? 
parable of the kingdom. I'm going to pray now. It is Rally Sunday, so our prayers will, of course, be for the beginning of a new year in the church. It's certainly a very different kind of year than we've experienced before. In the past, we've always prayed for the choirs and all the leaders, and, and some of this isn't a scene because we're not together in the same way, and yet still we pray for each other. Let's pray. Gracious God, merciful and steadfast in love, Time and again you have sought us out. You call us your children. You bring us home to life in you. You feed us with hope. You clothe us with grace. You work to shape us in your image that we might become ambassadors of your generous love. And we come to you giving thanks for our own community and praying for its leaders. Praying for those who are part of ministries of worship and music, Christian education, pastoral care, those who are engaged in mission and outreach, we lift up to you our work in this year and ask for your blessing. As we consider the work of your kingdom, we ask God that you would help us to learn to treasure the wisdom that you would have us live by. Help us to live in the assurance that each one of us is your beloved child and to treat each other as such as well. Take from us words of blame and guilt and envy that we often use when we speak of ourselves and others and open us up to live with a passion for justice and life, mercy and goodness, a generosity that keeps us turning to you again and again. The summer turns to fall and the harvest is gathered in. We thank you for all that sustains life, for your word and your spirit, but the gifts of the world for the fish and the mammals, trees, plants of every kind. For the gift of human life, we thank you. For the richness and diversity of our many cultures, for the energy of our youth, for the wisdom that comes with growing older, for the bonds of family and community, we pray this morning, God. We pray for responsible leaders and citizens, for healthy nations and schools, for plentiful food, for shelter and clothing. We call on your help in the face of all that we do not know how to change. And as we pray for the people of this world, our prayer is that your kingdom would come. We pray for those in faraway places and those nearer to home who are living in times of conflict, in the aftermath of hurricane or wildfire, in the midst of political or economic turmoil under the threat of war. We pray for all who are ill, for those who care for them, those who are waiting for test results or surgeries, those who are recovering. We pray for healing, body, mind, and soul. We remember before you, God, the saints who have lost their lives this week, those who miss them, those who are struggling with the loss they're facing. We pray, God, again for our church, for those who continue to walk the roads and enter the marketplaces of the world in your name, offering your invitation to life, seeking to be generous. As we bring you these prayers, God, we in silence bring our own prayers now. gathering all this up we ask that as we go into the world this week you will bless us that we might hold fast to your promise that life is good and share that promise and the gifts that come with it wherever we go in the name of jesus O oh god in your mercy hear our prayer amen we're not taking an offering today, and I need to clarify this because it was a little unclear last week. The offering plates are out, and when you leave the sanctuary at the end of the service, we invite you to put your offering in now. God's mercy is great, and our offering is a thank offering to God that is directed to the life and work of the congregation. As it says elsewhere in Matthew, freely we have received and freely we give.
Our words to remember for September are these. For we are God's masterpiece. God created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things planned for us so long ago. Take those with you as inspiration, as encouragement, as your charge, and that you might live into this wondrous calling. Go now in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.